I'm in control of my whole schedule. I never worry about missing, a, you know, a graduation, a game, or if my wife is working. I would say that uh, being a sheep shearer is a minority in the United States, and then being a woman is definitely its own subcategory. And then to be a gay woman, I don't think I know another gay woman sheep shearer besides my wife. Eventually, I realized that I actually was much more happy doing doula work than sitting at a desk doing nonprofit work. I remember thinking, like, this should be different. I have more freedom, more options. Um, I have more of a sense of uh, security for my family. As long as I'm bringing in $1,200 every other week, everything will be good. All I need is 15 pools. My name is Mark Jones. I'm 32 years old. I live in New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm the owner and pool tech at Blue Street Pools, and I'm on track to make between $89 and $100,000 this year. Blue Street Pools came from me manifesting my business something just dawned on me and it was like, man, eventually you're gonna have a whole street of pools. And all these pools are gonna be crystal clear, blue, blue street pools. Boom, and that's how I came. I grew up in Los Angeles, California. Mom was a teacher. My dad worked for the IRS. Stepdad worked for the light company. So I grew up with a real loving family. That was my dream. I thought I was going to the NBA like everybody else who plays basketball, but. <laughs> When I bought my house that had a pool in it because my wife, she wanted a pool. So we bought a house with the pool and I told myself, you know, hey, I'm young enough to figure this thing out. I got the pool, babe. Don't worry about it. I got it, you know, but I didn't even know how to turn the filter system on. But this is the pool where it all started right here and where the idea from the business came is when my neighbor across the street asked me who was cleaning my pool and I told him I did and he said look I'll pay you what I pay my other guy because I'm not impressed with his work um you just come across the street whenever you can and that's where I was like okay this is a business but that's where it really got tight when I got my first account because now it's like okay Mark you live across the street from him, so you can't come half-stepping with this, bro. Like, you gotta clean this pool, and they gotta be clean. It's giving you a shot. Once I, you know, got fired from Enterprise, and I took it serious when I went to Curly, I said, man, I think I'm gonna start my own pool business, man. And he was like, if anybody can do it, you can do it. And lo and behold, I zoomed out pools all over the place. And I'm just like, yo, this is crazy. Just in my subdivision alone, there was 38 pools. I started passing out flyers. Within one week, I was at five accounts. Before, while I was driving, you know, building, building my business, I was like, look, all I need is 15 pools. If I get 15 pools, I'm only working two days a week. I'm bringing home that $2,400 a month. Well, I started getting serious about it March 2020. In March, April, it's right before swim season starts, and that's where all these people's pools are green. And that's where I make a home run. I'm at your house two, three days, make six, six hundred to a thousand dollars from flipping your pool. And then on top of that, you might pick me up for service as well. The worst pool. Oh man, that I ever done. It's a blood ground pool full of, oh man, full of spiders, walking on water, leaves everywhere. Like, just like, look like the pool hasn't been touched in months. It was so nasty. It, it stinked. It got to the point where the algae was caked up. And it just, it, it, ugh. usually it takes me two days 
to get it pulled right. This one took me five days because it was so bad. I charged them $700 for that pool. I ended the year at, I believe, $44,000. That's what I made from March to December. I'm going to make six figures, but uh, six figures when I want to be uh, over $100,000. I'm on track to do that because it's summertime right now. And my biggest month so far this year uh, was around 8,500 in one month. And that was in the winter time. Bro, you'll never know the poor guy pulling up in this. <laughs> Incognito, bro. So I'm doing pool consultations and repairs on Mondays. Tuesday through Friday is my route. Nothing gets in the way of that. If you need a repair, like really green pools are when I, I really start them on Saturdays because it takes a couple days if I have to, you know, do my treatment to it. It takes a couple days for that to work. I don't work on Sundays. And then when I come back to work on Monday, I finish out the project for the green pool and get you back rolling. This morning, I hit my first pool at 6.30. You know, everybody else is asleep. I'm up cleaning pools. But well, really seven to two o'clock is Tuesday to Friday is, you know, that's, that's kind of my schedule. But I gotta be back in time if my wife is working to get the kids. And if I don't finish my route, once my wife gets back home, then, I'm, then I'll go back out and just hit a couple more pulls. Bye, camera. On my easy days, my oldest son, his name is Dallas, he's about to turn seven. He's been working with me since he's been five. All his job is to do is, hey, when you when you go to the backyard with daddy, you find those skimmer baskets, and all your job is to do is to empty out the skimmer baskets. And I'll pay you five dollars a pool. He's an entrepreneur himself. He's a he's a part owner of the company. I'm in control of my whole schedule. I never worry about missing, a, you know, a graduation, a game, or if my wife is working. He is true to his word. Blue Street Pools is where it's at. I tell everyone, if you want your pool clean, you get him. You get him. Absolutely. Yes. All I know is that I was a frustrated customer at one point and I didn't know what I was doing and I wish that I can go somewhere and see something where they simplified this process for me. And I think that's why people have gravitated to my page, not only the person doing the pool maintenance, but also he's actually teaching me how to take care of my pool. My wife has been with me every single step of the way. And when I got fired from Enterprise and I told her, I'm not going to work for anybody else anymore ever in my life. She was like, are you sure? I was like, yes, I am positive. And she was like, okay, I trust you. She was, she was the one bringing in the checks. She was the one paying the bills while I'm still figuring it out. And she never made me feel like I was this small. We figuring this thing out. We're in this thing together. I, I really love her for that and just being the person who she is because without that support, I would not be where I am today. It's definitely the foundation of, you know, where all of this success is coming from. never thought that I would be a sheep shearer when I was growing up. My first shearing job was when I was 14 years old. I made $5 a head, so it came out to a grand total of $35, and it took us half the day. My name is Katie McRose. I'm 26 years old, and I'm a sheep, llama, and alpaca shearer from Seguin, Texas. And this year, we're projected to bring in between $80,000 and $120,000.
If we didn't shear these sheep, they would be extremely hot in the summer. They've got to carry around the weight, they've got to carry around the heat, and in order to not make them suffer like that, we shear it off. Nowadays, if I make less than $1,000 in a day, it's a really slow one. So I grew up kind of all over the place. My parents were in the army. When they got out of the military, we moved out to the country, and that's where I first started collecting animals. imagine living this life without my wife because she literally like holds everything together. The only class that I uh, failed and had to retake in college was actually sheep and goat production, uh, which is super ironic. I did come out debt free, which was really nice. I didn't ever have to ask anybody to borrow any money um, or to, to help me out with rent, which was nice. The most I might be made in college was around 30,000 working part time. We knew that we liked shearing and that it allowed us to travel and we made decent money at it. So we decided to give that just a go at full time. You want me to grab the hooves and you trim them? Okay. The first year we did like 350 jobs. The year after that we did 475, 575. And this year we're gonna knock that out of the park again. How pricing works for shearing animals is by the head. For one sheep, it's $20 for me to shear it and $20 for me to show up. We call that a setup fee. If you have two sheep, it's still $20 a piece, but we have a $40 setup fee. And that $40 setup fee is uh, across the board. And when we get to 100 sheep, depending on the breed, you're looking at $5 a head. One or two llamas, it's $45 a head plus the setup fee. Same thing for alpacas, $30 a head for 10 of them plus the setup fee. So in four months already this year, we've brought in over last year's amount of $80,000. That's servicing about 480 farms. I have every intentions of reaching 600 or so farms this year, trying to break that 100 to 120,000 goal. Our season is from the end of February till July, but that is the only time that we really make money, except for about a month in the fall. So during shearing season, we work seven days a week, and it's typically 14 to 18 hours a day, depending on how hard we run. We leave the hotel around seven, uh, at our first job, probably about an hour away, get there around eight, and we could have anywhere from one job, which would be a large job with like uh, hundreds of animals, or we'll have multiple small jobs, our average being five to eight jobs a day, but we do as many as 14 in a day, and that's traveling from place to place. So shearing looks really easy when you watch somebody do it. Uh, somebody that's skilled, you look at it and you're like, wow, I mean, that stuff just falls off like butter. And it's there's a lot of uh, technical skill that goes into that. On an easy, normal sheep, uh, I'm shearing it between a minute and a half and three minutes. And then on the more difficult ones, it'll take me about five to seven minutes. Those shears are incredibly sharp. It goes really fast with high RPMs. It does not bog down, which means that it can cut through meat, it can cut through flesh, it can cut through bone, tendons, without skipping a beat. So it is very dangerous. And then I am holding an animal that has a mind of its own. 
just this year, cut my pinky in half. I broke my toe. I've been electrocuted over an extended amount of time. And I hooked my leg and put 22 stitches in it. A lot of people want to know how I can just run like the Energizer Bunny. And the thing is, is the Energizer Bunny does stop beating the drum eventually. You know, when you go that hard, it's really hard on your body. Uh, physical exhaustion is one thing. I can pretty much power through that, uh, but the mental part is really hard. Sheep shearing is mostly a mental game. Doesn't really matter about how strong you are. Um, it's about can you hack it for that many hours. I love shearing. I love shearing sheep. I love shearing alpacas. I love shearing llamas. I hate shearing goats, but that's besides the point. When you take a passion and you turn it into work, it is that, it is work. I, I love what I do and I honestly don't want to do anything else. It's just honestly being a business owner is not what it's all chalked up to be. Um, it's hard because nobody else takes that responsibility if you don't show up. I would say that uh, being a sheep shearer is a minority in the United States, and then being a woman is definitely its own subcategory. And then to be a gay woman, I don't think I know another gay woman sheep shearer besides my wife. I didn't want people to judge me before I ever got out there. Like, I didn't want being lesbian to be a defining part of me. As I've matured, I've realized that it doesn't have to be a defining part of me, but it is an excellent quality that I have. I was worried that it would affect my business and it hasn't because it turns out people don't care if I'm gay. It, what they care about is if I come in and do a good job on their sheep. Everybody's always gonna want and need air conditioning, depending on the climate, whether it's air conditioning or heating. I mean, that job is pretty stable. With all this experience I have now, I do consider myself an experienced tech. I take pride in having an excellent reputation online. My Yelp reviews are through the roof. I actually get a lot of referrals through customers. My name is Roger Quadra. I live in Corona, California. I'm an HVAC technician at Next Gen Heating and Air Conditioning. I make anywhere from 80 to $120,000 a year. Roger installs and repairs air conditioning, heating, and air purification systems in homes. From diagnosing unusual problems, to fixing older systems that need repairs, to long hours in 110 degree attics, the job can be tough. The majority of the time, I work six days a week. On a typical day, Roger makes about $336 in commission. The most difficult day, the customer had no power to their unit. They're pretty frustrated they couldn't turn it on. You check the whole system and uh, you just can't find the problem. And so you start questioning, you know, like, oh my gosh, start questioning your life. <laughs> it's like, what am I doing here? Oh my gosh, I'm on hour number four at this point had to go through all the low voltage wiring that connect to the outside unit and found some rodents there. So, alive, nesting. They chewed through all the wiring and it wasn't until my seventh hour till I found it. I couldn't get it off my mind for like the following week. That was my mistake that day for not starting there in the first place because it is a fairly common problem where rodents, you know, chew away at those wires and ruin systems. That's one of the biggest things customers do not understand in this industry. It's skilled labor. Skilled labor is not cheap. You're not necessarily paying for the part. You're paying for my knowledge and my service, plain and simple. Roger's been working in the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, or HVAC industry, for about 12 years. Today, he's one of the top requested technicians for his company, NextGen Air and Heat in Anaheim, California. But for Roger, getting to this point wasn't easy. I grew up in Whittier, California. I was actually born in Nicaragua, was brought over to Southeast LA County area, um, Santa Fe Springs, Whittier. One of my first jobs out of high school was at a Food for Less. I was a bag boy and making about $7.25 an hour. High school was an adventure. I didn't take it serious, to be completely honest. Even though I was trying to stay on the right track, you know, my family did sacrifice a lot to, you know, bring us out to the United States. 
being the oldest, my dad would sometimes take me to his job. And um, he encouraged me to get into mechanics. You know, he was a mechanic our life. To this day, he's a mechanic. Well, I think about him a lot sometimes when I'm actually working, just those moments that, you know, we shared when he would take me to his job. I joined the workforce after high school and, um, you know, started doing, you know, little construction jobs and really dead end jobs, to be completely honest. Things turned around for Roger in 2009 when he found an HVAC distribution center looking for a driver. I went in there, talked to the front desk guy, um, which is Ishmael Valdez, and um, asked for an application. I actually came in every single day for the next five days. His persistence paid off. Roger got the job as the driver. There he met HVAC techs who helped him reach the next level of his career. I started getting a lot of guys like, hey man, why don't you come over here and help us out on Saturday? Should start learning the ropes and whatnot. So eventually I got the opportunity to join a crew and be the third, the helper. When he started as a helper, Roger was making about $55,000 a year. He worked hard and rose from third helper to second helper to lead installer to technician in a matter of years. He's hoping to break the $100,000 mark this year. Even while working full time as a tech, Roger continued to improve his skills. So I dedicated myself, I would go home, watch YouTube videos, I actually enrolled myself into some classes that uh, the city of Downey provides at the gas company for NATE certifications, um, having to do with air distribution, heat pump units, uh, different types of systems that we use in the industry. Along the way, Roger stayed connected to Ishmael Valdez, who eventually branched off and started NextGen, where Roger is currently employed as a technician. Since then, Roger's experience has helped him increase his income. As far as the pay structure, it is uh, fully commissioned. You know, when you become a tech, sometimes there is those, you know, options to have an hourly wage and a partial commission. So by the way, I missed two months of last year. I, I feel confident I would have broke that 100K mark last year, but you know, I went on maternity leave. Another benefit actually that I think a lot of us take for granted is company vans, you know, we got the gas card, company trucks, so, you know, less wear and tear on our own personal uh, vehicles. Te muy bonito su día, guys. All right. All right, guys. All right, bro. Well, I usually wake up at 5.30 in the morning. I sometimes try to get a little jog in. I like to keep myself fit. I feel with that, it helps me have the, the energy to last all day and to deal with these 110 degree attics that we're in sometimes. I drive out to our main shop in Anaheim. I usually arrive around 6.30 or 7. Before a lot of our guys, I go through my bins, restock my, my van with you know, any parts necessary that I used the day prior. I usually have my first call around 9 a.m. in the morning. I usually call my uh, customer up, give them an ETA. I usually have about three to four calls a day. I average uh, you know, about 12 to 14 hours a day. I usually get home around 8.30, 9.30 at night. Summer is Roger's busiest season, so he can't take time off to spend with family until December. So my girls know, summertime, no vacations. Summertime is all about work for me. It's my money making time. That's when I make my majority of my yearly income. What that money means for me and my family is like I have more freedom, more options. Um, I have more of a sense of uh, security for my family, my family's future, my bills, of course. <laughs> you know, I get to spoil my girls. One of the things I love is uh, being able to provide. The majority of the time, I work six days a week. Uh, I, had, I do have an option to work on Sunday, which I take sometimes, but, you know, having the seniority that I have now and, you know, having a lot of new guys, I kind of hold back on Sundays now and uh, let the new guys take care of it. One of the most rewarding uh, things about this is uh, not only the money, of course, but, you know, just the, the, the satisfaction I get when I um, help these people out. Uh, we have like uh, little friendly comp competitions here at the company where, you know, we set goals for the week, for the month, for the year. Amongst the technicians have friendly competitions to kind of reach those goals and improve. At the beginning of his HVAC career, Roger started off making $55,000 a year. This year, he's closer to breaking the $100,000 mark, a goal he says contributes to his family's happiness. I obviously want to provide my daughters a 
way different life than, than I had. So, um, you know, not, not only is it a motivation, but it's very re rewarding knowing that I am able to do that for my girls. My advice to anybody that's looking in to get into this industry would be stop thinking about it and just do it. Take that chance, uh, whatever you got going on in your life. Uh, I'm pretty certain it's gonna be more beneficial to your longevity, your future, your, your financials. So do it immediately, don't be afraid, take chances. now been a doula for almost nine years. I sometimes compare us to wedding planners. Obviously, the couple that's at the center of it gets to make the decisions. Birth is something that, in my opinion at least, you should really be in charge of. My name is Samantha Griffin. I am 34 years old and I live in Maryland near Washington, DC. I'm a doula and the owner of DC Metro Maternity and I make about $85,000 a year. A doula is a person who supports birthing persons during pregnancy, birth, and postpartum. We're there to answer any questions, make sure that our doula clients understand what's happening with their bodies and with their emotions. And during labor itself, we're there making sure that people are hydrated, that they're fed, and that they're comfortable. I was in my mid-20s when I first became a doula. When I first started out, I had a lot of what I would now call imposter syndrome. Some of it was definitely that I hadn't had kids of my own. I also think some of it was just that this was such a departure from anything that my parents had done. My mom worked for the Department of Defense and my dad is retired from the Army. My dad always told me specifically not to go into the military. It was always the expectation that I would go to college and do a good job academically and then get a good job. In 2009, my very first job after college was at a small nonprofit that focused on helping mostly young women in the foster care system. A third of young women left the child welfare system in DC, either pregnant or parenting. All of their birth stories just sounded sad and lonely. And I remember thinking like, this should be different. As a community, we have higher rates of infant mortality and maternal mortality than everyone in the US other than Native American women. When I was Googling what the solutions were to maternal mortality, I learned about midwives and doulas. In order to become a doula, you take a training. It's usually a two-day training, but my very first doula training took two to three months to get through. Each side of the pelvis, you can create like 15 degrees more room. One of the challenges of being a doula is that the hours are strange and long. So babies often come in the middle of the night and it was really hard to juggle multiple things as well as go to people's births. Eventually I realized that I actually was much more happy doing doula work than sitting at a desk doing nonprofit work. So I quit everything, my day job at nonprofits and quit grad school. Hi Stephanie, it's Samantha. I hope you and everyone are doing well. There was a time where I felt a little bit sheepish about asking for money for something that feels really personal and also something that I do love doing, but this is hard work. It can be hard on your body. It can be hard on our own personal relationships. 
And I also think that charging has benefited my clients. They're in charge. I'm not doing anyone a favor. And instead, I'm just helping someone have a really empowered experience where they feel safe and peaceful. I run DC Metro Maternity and there are 10 of us right now that are labor and postpartum doulas. At the moment, all of the doulas on the team are black women, which is awesome because that's mostly who we serve. We get a decent number of doctors, lawyers, dentists, lots of people who are used to being experts in other areas of their lives. And so they're really hiring a doula to be an expert in pregnancy. This is where the milk would be stored and then that's how it travels. Okay. We know the different options. We know different hospitals, different providers. We're also one of the continuous faces that you see through things. In the medical system, they would call it continuity of care. We can be with our clients all the way from pregnancy to as their baby gets older in a similar way that your wedding planner might take you through, hey, we just got engaged all the way to the big day. If we're working with labor clients, then we do a couple of meetings with them ahead of time. We call these prenatal meetings. We'll talk through birth plans. Also, we'll talk through what we call comfort measures in labor. That's anything that helps someone cope with all of the sensations that come with having a baby. Does that feel good? Mm -hmm. Okay, then yeah, for you that works. There's different positions. There are massage techniques, breathing techniques. Sometimes the person that we're most supporting is not the person who's giving birth. When we're working with the non-birthing parent, dad, mom, whoever, we're helping them stay calm, helping them figure out where they fit into birth and how they can become a parent. I worked a lot with clients last year. There were times where I would have a daytime client and then go home, take a nap, and then do a 10 or 12 hour overnight shift. And so I think the most that I worked was 75 hours a week. If I can fulfill something for a client that we've promised them, then I want to. For people who are trying to conceive right now, are currently pregnant or in like the early postpartum phase, the first thing that I would recommend is breathe. Drop your shoulders, take a really big breath all the way from your belly, and then just let it out. Most of us are carrying a lot of tension and being stressed out is a really hard way to give birth or figure out what it's like to be a mother or a parent. I really hope that I get to be a doula until I am old and gray. The issues that led to maternal mortality rates in the US, which frankly aren't great for white women or other women in the US besides black women, they've existed for a really long time. So it's gonna take more than the not quite a decade that I've been working for that change to happen, but I'm hopeful that we're at least headed in the right direction. Mm -hmm.